Greetings to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My name is Gavi, and today I would like to set out on a new journey with all of you. I hope that in the coming weeks and months, and prospectively even years, that the instruction which will be provided through this channel will be of a blessing to you and to all those who you choose to share this with. In particular, the thrust, the idea, the guiding value behind what will be portrayed on this program will be an exploration of the scriptural understanding of what truth is, how it can be applied to our individual lives, and the value that we should or are instructed to place upon it as Christians. I understand that there are a plethora of opinions and ideas around what does and does not constitute Christianity. But what I am seeking to do here is to focus in entirely on the scriptural account of things, to lay aside traditions, to lay aside all manner of outside influences, and instead to go back to that idea which was first expressed by Martin Luther, although perhaps not lived up to as well as it could have been, of sola scriptura, from scripture alone. Now, I understand that I am a human and I am fallible, and certainly my own biases are going to leak into this from time to time, but I would hope that, as this is an open forum, that it would be an opportunity for discussion to rise up as opposed to contention or conflict or dismissal outright of the ideas and the concepts which I'm going to be bringing forth in the coming weeks and months and prospectively even years. I want to be able to present scripture in such a way as to be palatable, easy to understand, and as clear and concise as possible. I'm not particularly a very concise person. Nevertheless, I shall endeavor to persevere in this endeavor, which is redundant, but here we are. That being said, today in particular, I would like to begin addressing the first core value, the beginning, the vision casting, as it were, for this channel and for this series. And to do that, I would ask that you turn in your Bibles or just follow along with me. I'm not quite fully adapted to presenting a properly produced show. I'm kind of a fly by the seat of your pants kind of guy. And um, some of this is going to be very much in that vein. In particular, this point right here where I'm asking you to look up scripture and I don't have scripture to present to you on screen. Although, I think there's a lot of value to looking up scripture in your own Bible or on your own app or whatever it is that you're using, because then you can see it for yourself and you can, you don't have to take my word that what I'm presenting to you, not only in verbal form, but also in visual form eventually is accurate to that end. That is a very, there's also a very strong thing that I'm going to be recommending is that all the things that I present to you are things that you should be looking up on your own. And, and exploring and, search, and searching out. Truth is a search, or the search for truth is something which all people should be engaging in, whether in the Christian realm or in the broader realm of the world around us. We have a obligation as people to be properly seeking after and applying the truths that we have, see available in our lives around us. To that end, I would like to begin, as I said before, in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23. And this is a fantastic verse, and it quite, I could think of no greater verse which so concisely and succinctly says this, buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Now, the first part of that verse is what I'll certainly be drawing the majority of my vision for this channel and for future broadcast uh, from, but I want to focus in on this idea that buying the truth and not selling it. It says that truth is something which has value, which we must put forward in order to acquire. This is part of what I was referring to when I said that we should be using all the means available to us to search out things on our own, to engage in a pursuit of truth. It is not something which is so easily acquired as to just stumble into it, but something which we as people must put forth our hard-earned time, energy, money, resources, whatever it is required in order to attain it, to acquire it. And for a large part, I don't think this is something that needs a great deal of enumeration on, because to a certain extent, we all engage in this. We find something that we can realize is valuable, is truth. 
and we attach ourselves to it. But I would extend to you this idea that the truth being expressed here is not simply something in the abstract, in the abstract, but is in fact something very, very direct and personal and specific. And I say this because if this were just said out of out of context in a broader sense, buy the truth and sell it not, well, we should all, of course, be looking for the truth. But there is a much greater context because of where this is said, specifically in the Bible, is part of Scripture. And so when it refers to truth, it does not simply refer to the idea of this is true and this is false, or this is true and this is a lie, or this is the correct way of doing something versus the wrong way of doing something. But rather, this applies, I believe, to the entirety of Scripture as a whole and to the concepts, ideas, and values that it that it portrays. And to a much greater extent, I believe that we find a very, very clear enumeration of what this means a little bit later on in Scripture in John chapter 18. At this point in Scripture, we find that Jesus, having been already arrested by the Sanhedrin council and brought out of the Garden of Gethsemane and brought before councils and tribunals, and I believe this is also after he'd already been returned back from the council of Herod. This is his second time standing before Pilate. And Pilate is asking him a myriad of questions to try and discern why it is that these rabble-rousing priests have brought this man before him to be judged and executed. And he's just trying to get a sense of everything. And he begins by asking Jesus a series of questions. He says, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, John chapter 18, verses 33, 34. Jesus answered him, saying, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it, of, tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priest have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Why are you in front of me? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest, I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. And then Pilate asks this very, very important question in, chapter, in verse 38. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And I want to key in on this idea that Pilate, for all of his good intention, his desire to be a proper leader of the people, we to see elsewhere in scripture and also historically that Pilate was trying to be almost a friend to the people. He was obviously a Roman. He was a ruler. He could be a little bit tyrannical at times, although that was perfectly in line with his instructions as a governor in Jerusalem. It was required of him really to do a lot of things which we would find to be personally quite distasteful. And really, we would have all preferred had he not done many of those things. However, we see time and time again that he went out of his way to try and reach to the Jews. Even later on in the next chapter, when he says, Would you like me to give you Jesus of Nazareth or Barabbas to be released to you? This was a means of him trying to smooth things over, to try and create a sense of unity between himself and the Jewish populace, which he was tasked and ruling over. In this case, he is simply trying to determine what the purpose is that this man has been brought before him to be tried and condemned. He sees no purpose in it. He sees no value in it. He sees no reason to continue with it. Nevertheless, by his own mandate, he is required to stand there and to find things and to make inquiry and to execute judgment. Ultimately, we know how this story ends. But this question, which is sandwiched right in the midst, midst of all of it, what is truth. As honest an inquiry as it is, as frustrate, as much frustration as you can imagine Pilate had at this point to ask such a question. And then it says that he storms, oh, doesn't say he storms out. He says, after asking, um, and when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find no fault in him at all. He's frustrated. He's angry. He's saying, I don't want to have to deal with this. This is not part of my job. Why am I being tasked with this? What is truth? How can we know this unknowable quantity? But I would posit that as honest as his question was, it was in fact the wrong question to be asking. For you see, just a few chapters before in John, we find a different answer to a different question. A very similar question, a question which 
bears with it all the same information as Pilate was perhaps looking for, but the phraseology to it is very different. We find the answer, but not the question itself, in Jesus' address to his disciples at the Last Supper. We come into the play, into the upper room, and we find Jesus surrounded by his disciples and begins to teach them after having washed their feet. And he says, Let your heart, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, We know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We find the answer to Pilate's question, but not his question, for his question, I believe, is phrased incorrectly. He was foc- He was a man of the world, focused on the temporal things of the world, wrapped up in this idea of what is knowable in one situation from one side to the other, finding that common ground in the middle where truth usually lies in a subjective sense. But rather than looking to the idea of what is true in this situation, Jesus answered back in John, 8, in John chapter 14 a much more resolute idea and concrete idea of what truth is. I am the truth. Jesus Christ himself was the physical embodiment of truth in the world. His word is his lasting testament to all of us as an understanding and a means of interacting with that truth. We have access to God through his word and through his son and through his and to salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, allowing us to interact, to be, have that relationship with the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, that open door to God, who is truth. Jesus himself, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man can find, the, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. He limits all options to himself. I am the way, I am the truth. As Christians today, we hear these verses, we can look at them and say, oh, of course, it's so obvious. But we must understand that the context of this is so much greater than perhaps the obvious is. We know that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, but we don't often act like it. We don't often alter ourselves and form ourselves and put ourselves into a place of submission to his will to really act upon the idea of truth. And I believe that this is the case, not just because of our continual worldly influences, which we have playing upon us every single day, but much more so in that our interaction with truth is limited to that limited mindset, to that limited worldview, that in this moment, in this situation, what is true, but not who is true. What is truth is not the question, but rather who is truth. Jesus Christ declares himself to be that truth. We then as Christians have an op- have an obligation. If we are to be Christ-like, if we have to if we are to follow after him, giving all diligence to doing so, we should then have put within ourselves an idea and a mindset to seek after him in all things, laying all the areas of our life regardless of situation, of preference, of carefulness, of comfort. We should lay all these things at the foot of the cross and say, I will follow after Jesus to follow after truth in forsaking of all other things. Because that is what truth demands. That is the idea. When you encounter truth, truth demands an answer. And that is precisely what we see in Scripture. When encountering the man Christ Jesus, every person had to answer a question. Will you believe on the Son of God or will you not? Will you believe in the man Christ Jesus, or will you not? Will you accept the salvation that he offers, or will you not? All of Christianity falls around this idea, whether or not you will encounter truth, and whether you will submit yourself to it, whether you will give a good answer to that truth. For the answer is demanded by simple 
fact of existence. Because the truth exists, it demands of us that we provide an answer. It demands of us that we consider and give careful thought to how we ought to answer the reality of God made flesh and dwelling among us. Born of a virgin, crucified on the cross, raised the third day, received up into glory. This demands an answer of us. We are, therefore, at the place where we must wait our question, to wait our answer as to how we should respond, whether we should be scoffers or uncaring or unconvinced, or whether we should, with all due diligence, seek after that truth. If we should, with all due diligence, seek to make that truth an active, everyday part of our lives. That is the question we are faced with now, whether or not we will fully interact and fully integrate with the fullness of the truth of God, whether we will make that an everyday part of our lives. The truth stands alone. It does not require anything from us to be the truth. But we require things of the truth. We require the way and the life. The truth stands alone, but the way and the life are things that we have access to. We have an opportunity to engage with through that truth. If we will simply do what is required. The question of whether we will, we will do those things, of course, is a very personal one and one which we must answer for ourselves. And in the coming weeks, I mean, next week, I'll be engaging much more in the how do we respond to this or why should we respond to this? But today I want to just pull back a little bit and focus on this idea that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the one by whom we have access to the Father. He is the one by whom we have access into eternal life. He is the one by whom we have access into a better way of life. But it requires an answer. Asking the question, what is truth, is a very, or what is the truth, is a very human answer. It's a very human idea to try and quantify a situation. What is the truth in this situation? to try and figure things out and systematize and categorize everything around us into easily digestible and understandable ideas. But Jesus Christ is so much more than that. His value to all of us is so much greater that it cannot be easily quantified into a simple pat answer of yes or no or this or that or right or wrong. It is that he is, therefore there is truth. Because God exists, we have a guarantee of truth in the world around us. We have a guarantee of truth that we can interact with, that we can make a part of ourselves. And so I would encourage you, I would strongly, strongly suggest that take a moment of self-reflection, of understanding, of study even, to go into the scripture and to seek out what it is that he means by I am the truth. Again, if you continue coming back to these short lessons, I will be doing my best to explain this in as full a capacity as possible. I am trying, however, to keep these to a certain short period of time, about 20 minutes or so, so as to not overburden the mind with large abstract ideas or tiny, minute, slow plotting details. Either one, both of which I particularly enjoy. But for the moment, just for this time, Rather than worrying about the overarching or the minutia of how this would work, think simply of this idea that Jesus Christ declared himself to be the truth. We live in a world right now where everyone is talking about describing their truth and declaring their truth and my truth. How prideful to try and elevate our own human ideas and concepts to a similar level as God made flesh. How prideful. I love the simplicity where he simply says, I am the truth. A very powerful statement. A very powerful statement, not just because of its simplicity, but also because of the deity involved in that. That I am statement is a reference back to Moses in the burning bush. That when you send me to your people, whom shall I say is the name of the God that sends me? I am hath sent me. This very same statement issued here, I am am the truth. 
a very, very succinct yet powerful statement of who God is coming to this earth to provide clarity and peace and joy and life forevermore to all of his creation. I thank you all for your kind attention, your interaction with this new endeavor. I understand that this is going to be a little bit different, and I have this now on multiple platforms, both on YouTube and on Locals. I'd appreciate it if you would take the time to engage with both of these channels, to subscribe, not, perhaps not on Locals, because I don't, I'm not trying to earn money off of this, and that is just a requirement for setting up a uh, channel, a website on Locals, um, that you have to have a, a paid subscription model. I'm trying to keep everything as free as possible, and I think I have that worked out. If I'm wrong, I apologize and I'll make adjustments in the future. But take this broad concept of Jesus being truth and think about it in this coming week. In the next week, we'll be talking about a proper response to God and to this idea that Jesus is truth and how we as humans can interact with that on a very personal level because that is where the value comes in. That is where we get to that point of, buying the truth, providing something of value, and then accepting nothing lesser than the truth in exchange for it. And that is the overall arching idea behind all of this, that there is truth and there is a way to respond to it, and it will probably cost us something, but it is worth it. So with this, I say, may the Lord bless you in your coming week. May the Lord bless you in your endeavors and your desire to know more of him. I thank you again very, very much for taking the time to engage with even my limited understanding of God as a means to better yourself as a Christian, as I also seek to better myself as a Christian. May God richly bless you throughout this week. Goodbye.